If you're new to this channel, you may consider subscribing and hit the bell icon so that you continue to receive the updates. Please share it with all others who might benefit. Let's get started. All right, so in our previous videos, we've talked about the theoretical foundations of market basket analysis. In the first video, we talked about the concept of support, confidence, and lift. In our second video, we tried to explain how these algorithms are optimized using the a priori properties. With the foundations in place, it's time to move to the hands-on exercise. And for our hands-on exercise, we're going to take up a data set which is available at the famous UCI machine learning repository. So this data set is called Online Retail and it has about more than 540,000 instances. We have six features and the feature definitions are already given here. This is the paper reference from where this data set has been obtained. Uh, keep this in mind that when we talk about market basket analysis, we primarily are going to need two columns. We would need a transaction ID or the invoice number, and we will need an item description. So invoice number in our case, it says it's a six digit integral number uniquely assigned to each transaction. If this code starts with the letter C, it indicates a cancellation. So while working on the data, we'll have to see how we can filter out these transactions and work with only those transactions which were accepted and not canceled. Likewise, we have a column called description, which would have the product description. Again, it depends on the quality of the data. At times when you're working on, let's say, a CPG or consumer package data, you may have brand level details and the variety that comes within a product also available, but totally depends on the way the data has been collected. We'll look at it as we start working on the data. So that said, let's move to Google Collaboratory where we'll start working on this data. Here we are at the Google Collaboratory and we will be using a specific library which provides us the a priori and association rules classes. This is known as the ML extend. This has a module called frequent patterns which gives us access to the a priori class and the association rules class. Of course, we'll be also needing pandas because we'll be working on the data frames. Now we may get some deprecation warnings and in the beginning, we're just choosing to suppress them. These might become important at a later stage, but for now, for our purpose, it'll be totally fine if we just ignore those warnings. So I've already pointed to the data source, which is readily available at the UCI machine learning repository for which a link is provided to you. Once the data set is read, we can start inspecting the data a little bit. So if I look at the shape of the data, it kind of confirms that it has around 541,000 rows with eight features. If we randomly try to sample some of the observations just to get an idea about how this data looks like, we can use the sample method from the pandas and we are looking at five such observations. Notice you might get different observations because this is just a random sampling technique, but it kind of gives us an idea that we have an invoice number, we have a stock code, we have description, we have quantity, we have the invoice date, the unit price, the customer ID, and the country. Now, this is an analysis, like I said, it's focused around the invoice number or the transaction ID and description. So we'll be particularly focusing on these columns first. That's what is written here as well. Let's quickly check the data types. What is the nature of variables that we have? So if you see invoice number, while we looked at the random observations, it looked like it has numbers. Panda says it's an object data type. And this is not a surprise because when we read the feature description, we saw that there are such invoice numbers which begin with alphabet C and those are canceled invoices. So obviously when you have a column which contains all numbers, but it has some entries which have anything other than number available, pandas would begin to treat it as an object. And that's what is happening here. Description is supposed to be object. That's how it is here. That's fine. We can also check for the presence of missing values because if you do not have the item available or transaction ID available, it is not advisable that you include those records here. We would not prefer doing imputation for these purposes. So let's see if we have missing values in any of these features. So invoice number says is not containing any missing value as of now, but description definitely has missing values, about 1,400. And that's not a big number considering a base of about 540,000 records. So we can easily get rid of the records or the rows which contain a missing value for description. So what we're doing is we are going to drop such rows with axis is equal to zero where the feature called description is missing. We are doing in place is equal to true so that this affects the data that we just read some time back. That being done, we can check for the presence of missing values again. 
We have missing values for customer ID because we never treated them. But for the description, all the missing rows have been eliminated. Now, when you have a feature like description, and let me just take you to the appearance of that feature. What we're going to do very soon is we're going to group everything by the transaction ID and description. And if such features which have strings contain extra white spaces, could be leading or trailing white spaces or in between have white spaces, it will confuse pandas to treat them as separate entries. So what I mean to say is, let's say if there are two spaces and then this name starts versus this name starts directly. These are two different things. So we just want to be consistent. We want to eliminate all extra white spaces when we are dealing with strings. And that's what we are pretty much doing in the next line of code through regular expressions. So we are importing the library called RE, which stands for regular expressions, choosing the column called description, which we are converting to a string type. And then we are applying a Lambda function. Now, these are inline functions which do not require us to use the define keyword or the return keyword. We simply can apply them on the go. So we are saying, let's apply the sub method, which looks for the occurrence of one or more spaces. So this backslash S represents space characters plus here represents one or more occurrence or repetition of spaces. We are saying we will replace it with a single space and we are also doing a dot strip which will take care of the leading and trailing spaces. String begins with a space or ends with a space that will be taken care by this dot strip method. And also in between, if you have any extra space, that will be eliminated and reduced to just a single space with the help of this regular expression. Once we do this, if you have any such problem in the data, that will be at risk. If none, then you'll ask it be found. So this has been done. Now we are trying to sample some transactions which contain a specific type of invoice number which has been cancelled. So we're just trying to see what the pattern is like. We are taking the invoice number column from the data, converting it to a string type. This is explicit type casting. Then within that, we are checking whether it contains the alphabet C. So we are doing dot .str dot .contains for that purpose and sampling 10 such observations. Let's see if we have such transactions which contain the alphabet C and represent cancellation. So if you see all these are 10 randomly sampled observations from the data which satisfy this specific filter that they have canceled transactions. Notice instead of contains, we could have also used starts with. That's again a string relative method. So starts with would particularly look for the alphabet C right in the beginning. But if you say that anywhere in the string, if you have a C present and you want to find it, then you can use dot contains. Again, a specific choice that we can make depending on the path. So yes, we have such transactions which have been cancelled. Now we don't want to be analyzing those transactions that have been cancelled. So let's go ahead and exclude these observations from our data and then work on the rest of the data. In order to be able to do this, what we are doing is we are saying invoice number to be converted to string. And this tilde symbol, if you see here, is representing negation or exclusion. So we are saying from the data frame, we want to exclude those invoice numbers which contain C. In a way, these two lines that you see, except for the tilde symbol, is something that we already used to get to these transactions. We use a dot sample method here. But if we put it here like this, we are simply doing a negation over and above what we checked, and it will take care of all such transactions which were canceled. So if you see, this number is to the tune of 531,000. To begin with, we had about 541,000 rows. So obviously, we lost about 10,000 rows, but this base is quite significant. And including cancel transactions does not make sense. So we are not losing any meaningful data here. Now in the next line of code, what we're trying to do is we're trying to check what kind of country relative information do we have in our data. So if you see the last column here represents the countries. And do we have more than one country? Do we want to focus on a specific geography? Let's try to do that. So we are checking the total number of countries by doing the n unique method on the country column. And after that, we are skipping a line and then we are saying we want to check the value counts of the countries. We are normalizing the value counts which will convert the counts into proportions. Let's just see what we get. So we have 38 unique countries. These are very different geographies that we have. And if you look at this, majority of these come from United Kingdom. Then we have about 1.7% of the transactions coming from Germany. Then we have 1.5% from France and so on and so forth. If you want to work on a specific geography, we can always filter it. In order to keep it simple this time, we're choosing to work with the data that's specific to Germany. If you believe that you want to do analysis for United Kingdom, you can, of course, 
keep it to United Kingdom. Generally, in case of market basket analysis, it makes sense to do it region-wise or geography-wise. There are countries where you would find a huge variation in terms of the preference when it comes to, let's say, the groceries and the delicacies they prepare from one region to another. So in that case, clubbing the entire data together might not give you the complete picture. You may want to come up with a region-specific recommendation. If not region, we can do this filter at least at the country level in this case, and that's what we are choosing to do. So what we are saying is that from the data frame, we want to filter those rows which are belonging to Germany. This double equal to is basically a check for equality. Then we're doing a couple of interesting methods in a chained way, and let's go through each of these one by one. Now, these are very important, and we'll spend time understanding each method. So we are grouping by the invoice number and description. We discussed in the beginning that these are the two columns that we are primarily interested in. Invoice number, which is the transaction ID, and the item description. This dot size would essentially talk about the counts, counts of such transactions. This dot on stack here is like a pivoting method which converts the description into the columns. So if you had three items purchased together, each item would begin to occupy a column. I'll show you the outcome in some time that will make things clearer for you. Now, if you remember in a theory example, we said that probably the restaurant sells hundreds of items, but a given order may contain maybe two, three, or four items only. So what happens to the remaining items? Because when you convert every item as a feature and a restaurant, let's say, sells 100 items. In our case, this is a different data. So let's say we have 1,500 items. You will end up getting 1,500 plus columns. Just an example. A given order has maybe five items. So what happens to the remaining places? Because your data set scope is like it's extending to 1,500 features, but you're saying for each row, you only have, let's say, four or five items on an average. So for the remaining places, you'll have NANs there those NANs are being converted to zeros. If you don't do this, it'll give an error at least. Now let's focus on this dot reset index. This essentially is used to put the indices of the data frame in order. Why do we need this? Because if you remember, we dropped certain rows because the description was missing. Then we dropped certain rows where the transaction ID or the invoice number represented a cancellation. And then further, we have filtered the data only specific to Germany. So all of these indices will no longer remain in order. The start reset index basically brings all the indices into an order, and then we are applying a set index method. So what we're doing is we are making the invoice number as our index. If I show you the output, the data would look a little different now. This is how your data is. So your invoice number has become the index of the data frame, and all these items that we have have become the features of the data frame. Now you can see that we have about 1,700 different items available here. In our theory videos, we talked about a restaurant example where we said they might be selling 100 odd items. But here, if you look at this, this is slightly different data and we have, of course, more items available. So we've just made a rearrangement and you can see that this is all filled with zero. No, it's not entirely filled with zeros. That's how it looks like right now because you have 1,600 plus columns. How many columns are you looking at right now? Maybe 10 or 20 columns maximum. So there would be values available wherever a particular item exists. But at this time, we are not necessarily interested in the count of items. What we are interested in, the presence of items. Now, let's say in a given transaction, somebody brought coffee and bread. Now, we are not interested in how many units of coffee or bread were bought. We are only interested in seeing that they were bought or not. So what we're doing is that wherever we have an item that's not present or we have a value that's negative, that would not be the case with counts, but let's say if you have some values which are less than zero in some other metric, we are saying that we will convert it to zero by writing a custom function. And whenever we have a quantity which is greater than or equal to one, which means the item was present, we are simply reducing it to one. And then we are applying this custom encoding to our data. All it does is this converts your entire data that you got above into zeros and ones. If the quantity was more than one, that will be reduced to one. If the quantity was zero or less, the quantity was zero, it will remain zero, as simple as that. Now we are applying this custom encoding function using the apply map method on pandas. And there's one more line of code that we're writing here. Let me just skip this for the time being and I'll come back and execute this after some time. Let me just run this here and we'll tell you the reason why we have a specific line here. Now we are calling the a priori class where we give the group data frame as the input. When we discuss the a priori algorithm, we discuss that a priori kind of optimizes 
based on the minimum support. So we can give the threshold here. Now, this is not something that you have to necessarily follow for every data, but this value may be very specific and you may want to tune it just like you do hyperparameter tuning. So we're taking the value as 5% and we are using the column names. Let me just run this. And then in order to get the rules, we are using the association rules class where we give the input as the frequent item sets and we mention the metric as confidence. And we mention a threshold for confidence as well. Again, 0.6 is not set in stone. We can always try to modify it based on what kind of rules we get. If you get no rules or very few rules which are meaningful for you, you may want to be lenient on these values. You may reduce the confidence, you may reduce the support. But if you're getting too many rules, you may want to increase these values and look at only the ones which are very important for you. Let's run this. And finally, the output of this is being generated, which we are sorting by the lift in descending order. We've discussed all three metrics, support, confidence, and lift in the theory. So here's the outcome. Now, if you look at these items, let's say this is some kind of a bag which is pointing towards consequence as postage and some other kind of bag. This is a bag that goes along with another bag. Looks like the data is a little different here, but postage is appearing here again and again. If I scroll down further, you will see postage as the only consequent. No, people do not come to buy postage. People come to buy items and postage is a charge that's probably added additionally. Just like at a lot of places when you do some shopping in a store, you are paying for a carry bag. But carry bag is not the item that you went there for, right? So likewise, in an online purchase, there may be a charge associated with postage that shows up as a separate item. That's the reason here we wrote this line in the previous cell where we said we want to drop the postage column. Postage is not an item that we sell. That's something which is there as a result of what the customer chose to purchase and it was to be shipped, okay? So we'll rerun this again so that we don't have that postage as the consequent. So what is a consequent here? Consequent is something that's essentially being recommended, provided antecedent is already there. So now if you see this bag is recommending this bag, this snack box set of four fruits is something that's going well with another snack box set, which is a collection of four boxes. Something which is a lunch box is going well with another set of four boxes. So the data is different, right? So it's not a CPG or consumer package good data or a restaurant data that we're looking at, but you can try it wherever it's applicable, you know? Amazon doesn't necessarily recommend you items which are only to be consumed, like groceries. Amazon gives you that recommendation even for electronics. Same way here, it looks like we have a data which comes from a slightly different background, but you can look at in a store what kind of items can be plugged together. Also note that there are some additional metrics that this association rules kind of gives you apart from support, confidence, and lift. These are leverage, conviction, and Zhang's. We've not talked about it, but I'll share a reference with you, which is essentially the GitHub reference for the ML Extend library that we have used, which has all these definitions. These are all metrics derived using support and confidence. So you can read about these, but if you're good with the basics, then we are at home with this much. So notice we gave a threshold of support, which was 5% and above, right? So you have all the values of support for the rules, which are found in 5% or more transactions. Likewise, we gave a threshold of confidence, which was about 60%. So you're getting those rules where the confidence was at least 60% or more. And then we said we want to sort it by the lift. That's why it has done a descending sort. So this was a quick walkthrough of the hands-on piece. Please note, you must have observed the data preparation here was a little different compared to the typical data preparation that we do in case of machine learning exercises, because this exercise is a little different. But market basket, again, pretty much falls in the category of unsupervised learning. Why? Because you're exploring patterns in the data here. So this is unsupervised learning. You're not predicting any specific outcome. You're trying to map the patterns and you're trying to then prioritize based on these numbers, which is the rule that say you are more confident about to apply. And the application now could be in the form of putting these items together, creating their combos. In fact, you can add more intelligence to it by incorporating more features. Like you may look at the profitability angle. So you may say that we will want to come up with those combinations which are most profitable for us or which are high ticket items. There's no end to it. But the bare minimum that you would need for market basket analysis, of course, would be the item description and the transaction ID. That's what we primarily worked with. Hope this helps. Thank you.